Mike is, has four different um, passages for us to consider this morning. We're going to look at them in this order. So starting with Leviticus chapter 24. So turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 5 through 9. Again, 24 verses 5 through 9. Starting with verse 5. Then you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six to a row on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offering by fire, his portion forever. Then turn over in your New Testament to Luke chapter 6, and we're going to consider verses 1 through 5. Again, Luke chapter 6. Verses 1 through 5. Now it came about that on a certain Sabbath, he was passing through some green fields, or grain fields, and his disciples were picking and eating the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them and said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now flip back over into your Old Testament. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 21. That's 1 Samuel 21 and verses 1 through 6. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech, the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter, and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and with which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. Now, therefore, what? Do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread, if only the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out and the vessels of the young men were holy. Though it was an ordinary journey, how much more than today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread. For there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. And then finally, flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, again, verses 5 through 9. 7, 5 through 9. Now it came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all of his enemies that the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind for the Lord is with you. But it came about in the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I have commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. 
And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. Well, good morning. We are uh, beginning our 21st lesson in the life of David, a king without a kingdom. And uh, thank you for this wonderful weather. I woke up uh, Friday morning in Oklahoma City. It was uh, 57 degrees. And we are, I thought, I'm in heaven. No, it's still just uh, the fall. Uh, this is uh, our study. Uh, and if uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David coming to Nob. And if you are this morning uh, here at Believer's Chapel and living under unplanned providences, what do I mean by unplanned providences? Well, you uh, thought you would be living there, but you're living here. You thought you would be uh, having uh, grandchildren by now, but you don't have grandchildren. You thought you would uh, have your wife or your husband with you at this portion of your life, but you don't. Unplanned providences. And if you are living in something like that, staring out the window of a hospital room with a diagnosis that you knew nothing about before, and thinking about the unplanned providence God has put you through, then you are in the right place at 1 Samuel chapter 21, David at Nob. This young man had been the toast of the town and all Israel for just a few weeks past. But now he is a common criminal. His life has literally been turned upside down. The champion of them all is now fleeing like a fugitive. All because of one man. You ever had the one man in your life that as long as I'm here, you will never succeed? You will never be able to prosper and accomplish what you want to? because I'm going to see to it that you don't. If you are living in that providence, you can identify with David. He had one man, and it was Saul of Benjamin. The one man after Israel's own heart, not the Lord's own heart. Give us a king to rule over us, the people said. We want someone like all the other despots and tyrants and oppressors of the world. And that's exactly what they got. So these are the times. And David is on the run. That is this area of his life now. He had run to Samuel. And from Samuel to Jonathan. And now from Jonathan, he goes to Nob, which is about three miles from where he was previously in Gibeah of Benjamin. That, of course, is the king's territory, Saul. The tabernacle of the Lord was there at that time. And it is here that Abimelech, the great-grandson of Eli, the priest who was in 1 Samuel at the beginning, uh, this Ahimelech is uh, probably very advanced in years, but that was his great-grandfather. Years later, David is going to promote Ahimelech's son to be priest. One other fact of about Ahimelech that we need to know regarding this, this text and its pertinence to us is his brother was a man by the name of Ahijah, A-H-I-J-A-H, -A -H, Ahijah, and he was an advisor to the king, Saul. So Ahimelech the priest is linked in to the family of Saul. 
Now, several teachers, including Alfred Edersheim, have suggested that David coming to Nob on the Sabbath, which would be a wonderful exclamation point that Jesus made with his disciples in the passage that we just read in Luke chapter 6. We don't know if that is actually the truth, but it's a wonderful thought. The disciples picking the grain as they're walking across the fields. But here is our text, 1 Samuel 21, beginning in verse 1. David's arrival. Observe it caused trembling. The term is used for the first time in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 13, where Ahimelech, the great grandfather, uh, was Eli, had used this same word about himself, trembling. That was uh, chapter 4 and verse 13. That was the day that the ark of the Lord had been lost to the Philistines, and he trembled. In 13.7, this word is used, the Israelite army trembled before the Philistines. And in chapter 14 and verse 15, this same word is used with the Philistines taking their turn at trembling before the Israelites. And now this is the word that we had already looked at earlier at the beginning of our study, chapter 16 and verse 4, where the arrival at, of Samuel at Bethlehem coming to see the family of Jesse caused the elders of that place to tremble. The term invokes a profound fear. Terror would not be too strong a word for what Abimelech felt when he saw David approaching. Wonder why? His greeting is a compound question, which in the inspired language puts an exclamation point to the question. Look, why are you alone and no one is with you? And look at the parallel to the compound question. Alone, no one with you. Apparently, David's arrival had just not set well. Something was off, and it disturbed Ahimelech, David's arrival. He being a military leader, we would naturally think he would bring an entourage of soldiers with him. Now, let's just pause here and soak up the scene, which I don't think we do a good job of in narrative. Let's soak up the scene. And how do we do that? By asking this question. Could anyone have looked less like a king than David at that point? Here he is, alone, no weapon, probably famished, kind of directionless, and he shows up. Could anyone have ever imagined that he was the most important man alive in the world that day? How about the Apostle Paul? If 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 through 33, he describes his torments as an apostle, beaten with rod, shipwreck, day and night in the sea, dangers, journeys, and waters, robbers, dangers in the city, dangers in wilderness, often hungry, thirsty, naked, cold, and yet he was the most important man alive in the world in his day. He was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Here is David, alone, hungry, no weapons. And think about the providences in your life. Those times when things got really thin. 
Oh, the things that God puts us all through. And isn't that what John Newton was teaching us when we sang, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. He came to Nob, David, to find a friendly face, but instead his presence provoked fear. Why? What's going on? Here is David's response, verse 2. It provokes a lot of questions. And it may take the balance of our time to delve into these questions. They are questions of theology. They are questions of ethics. Let's just try to keep our eye on the text. Is he protecting Ahimelech here? Providing him plausible deniability? That's exactly what Ahimelech will plead to Saul in the future when Saul says, I'm going to have you killed. Here's David's words. Let no one know of the task of which I am sending you. David creates the notion that he's on a mission of His Majesty's Secret Service. Joyce Baldwin, a post-World War II British scholar, said David was unsure to trust Ahimelech at this time by or due to his family connections. Thus, he makes up the story espionage. Remember, we've just come off the New Moon Festival previously. Saul had already declared David to be a criminal. Please the king, kill David. 1 Samuel 20, verse 31, he tells Jonathan, as long as the son of Jesse is alive, your throne, which is really my throne, is not safe. Now, it is here that I depart from a lot of the preaching on this text and some of the commentaries that I have read. I have a different view than what they have taught. So, I depart from them and I now set forth my case to you this morning. Southern Baptist preachers, and I'm not here to rain on the Southern Baptist. I'm grateful to God for them. After I got saved, I was actually baptized in a Southern Baptist church. But... They have a way of trying to make a point without the text being involved in it. It's my view. And they introduce the idea that this is now the beginning of one of David's apparent flaws. Here it is. His deceptive ways. We find it for the first time in his life. That deception of David is ultimately going to find its fruition in the death of Uriah and the adultery of Bathsheba. My approach is different. I read a narrative and I ask, why was or what was the intent of the writer as he is delivering this text to me, the inspired writer? He's writing a divinely inspired history. And the Apostle Paul tells me in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that that divine history is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, was it the intent of the inspired writer to show me David's flaw? The great John Murray, 
who wrote a fabulous commentary on the book of Romans, probably one of the greatest written in the English language. John Murray said, a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. David is being deceptive here. No doubt about it. Corey Ten Boom told her sister, when the Nazis come to our door and they ask, are you hiding Jews? We must lie. Her sister said, no, we must never lie. And then came the day and the Nazis entered in their house. And they asked, are you hiding Jews? And Corey's sister said, yes, pointing under the table. They bent down. They all had a laugh. No Jews under the table. They left. Of course, under the table and under the rug and under the floor was the basement and there were the Jews. In the book of Judges, chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, we have a, a very brave and noble woman, a Jewess by the name of Jael, just like the prison cell, J-A-I-L. They were in a conflict with a king by the name of Sisera. And on one fine day, who would stumble into the camp of the Israelites but Sisera himself? He was haggard. He was exhausted. He looked like he hadn't slept in three days. She invited him into her tent. You never do that. She did. She gave him goat's milk. She bundled him up, fluffed up the pillow, and he went fast asleep. And what was her motive? What was the intent? She drove a tent peg right through his head. And for that, she is praised. Was it deception that she entered into? Now you say, well, that's warfare. Oh, good answer. But let me ask this question. What's the difference between warfare and what David is actually going through? David's a king. And David's an innocent man. And David has the entire government against him. That is warfare. To be sure, David will never lift a finger to become king. God will do it all. And there is a lesson in that for all of us later. But here's my point. When it comes to narrative, we have to be careful about assigning things that aren't in the text. Let me illustrate. The narrative in the New Testament is Acts. In Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 36, you have the division between Paul and Barnabas regarding John Mark. Who's at fault? Bitter disagreement. Well, the text doesn't say. Yet I have heard over my years that Paul was absolutely right. Oh no, it was Barnabas. He was the one that was right. My point is the text doesn't say. Here's another one. Acts chapter 18. Historic narrative. Paul is in Jerusalem. He takes a Nazarite vow. I've heard that taught before. And here's the way it was presented to me. The apostle of the sovereign grace of God went rogue. He forgot all about the sovereign grace of God. 
and he put himself back under the law. He took this ceremonial law and he put himself back under it. That just didn't sit well with me when I heard it for the first time. I asked some questions. I was told that I need to be careful not to deify Paul. I was a young believer at the time, didn't know much of the scriptures, and so I've thought about that. Now, years later, decades later, here would be my response. How am I deifying the man who called himself the chief of sinners? How could I possibly be glorifying Paul when he described his Christian life as a wretched man who is saved only by the sovereign grace of God? Back as a seminary student, I had to do an exegetical paper. That's a paper with the, that you have to go through a specific form in the original language and come up with an interpretation after doing your work. It was on 1 Corinthians 9.22. That's where the apostle says, I become all things to all men that I might win some. And then in that context, he explains what that verse means. Paul describes his manner with dealing with people. All kinds of people. Here's what he says. Look it up for yourself. 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 21. He says specifically to the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. And here is his purpose. So as to win those under the law. What's he saying? I'll do a ceremonial law. Because a ceremonial law doesn't mean anything. But I'll build a bridge to my people. And if that will help, if that will help and give me some credibility, some common ground with my people, I'll do whatever I need to do. My point is that when Paul took that Nazarite vow, the narrative just reported what happened. It doesn't assign any interpretation to it. I take Paul at his own word and the way he conducts himself. I think that it all fits together there. So, here we are, back in our text. 1 Samuel 21, David's on the run. The federal government is after him. There's no court of appeals to go to. No attorney to stand with him to represent him. No surrogate for him. He's like the Apostle Paul. He was abandoned like he was, Paul was before a Roman tribunal. He appealed, to, uh, he appealed to Samuel. But what could Samuel do? Saul's now the king. He's taken over. He appear, appeared, appealed to his son Jonathan, but Saul was angry at him through a spear. Tried to kill his own son. Now he comes here this morning to our text at Nob. There's a tabernacle. There are priests there. To do what? What does the text say? To collect some daily provisions because, because he has no idea what is about to come about tomorrow. His world is upside down. Dan is taking us through 1 Peter. And 1 Peter talks about the trial of faith. 
my friends, young David is in the oven. And that's really what's going on here. I do not understand why people are so critical of him. But I think, I think it might have something to do with doctrine. And so I want to address this for a moment. The Bible teaches the doctrine of progressive sanctification. Let me explain that. But I'll begin this way. Something that no writer tells me and no preacher ever preached to me on this text, how young David was. Well, so what? Well, here's what. In 1 Samuel 17, when he faced Goliath, he couldn't qualify for the military. And he was completely dismissed because he was a youth. He's a young man. The Bible teaches that as we grow in faith, we mature. That is the opposite of a doctrine called Lordship Salvation, which says that your faith that you come to Christ in is the faith that you live every day in. I believe in progressive sanctification. And I believe that the Bible teaches that. That was the model that I was given back in 1975 by S. Lewis Johnson. Why do I call it a model? Well, it's a model because there is no one normative text that describes all of the doctrine of sanctification. We have to put it together and form a model. I'll illustrate it this way. You've got a man and a woman standing on a stage. You have three cameras. Here, camera one, camera two, camera three. We start the scene with camera one. Oh, look, we've got a couple. They're holding hands. They must be lovers. Camera three. Uh, they're not holding hands, but she's holding something. And she's frowning. Might not be in love after all. Then third camera. Oh, she's frowning all right, and she has a knife in her hand. But my point simply is that that's a model. I have to have all three cameras to understand the scene in its totality. Not one view gives me everything. Progressive sanctification is one camera in the doctrine of sanctification. It's a model. And I'm not here to lecture on sanctification only to make this point. David's a young man. Will anybody extend him grace as a young man? Not knowing where to go or what to do. He's hungry. He has no weapon to defend himself. He's coming to Nob. The element of progressive sanctification is just what it says. It's progress. Progressive sanctification. That's called growing in Christ. You ever heard that? What's the metaphor for growing in the New Testament? It's walking. Walking. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by the Spirit. 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walked. The spiritual life is walking. And that's a picture of progress. 
Now, you're not too immune from that, are you? How did your children learn to walk? Did they sit there in that crib and climb up those bars, put that chin over the top bar, and as you walked in and out of the room, did they say, wow, what unbelievable peripatetic action that is? Well, what'd they say? I'm going to try to do that. And they take a step and they go down. And two steps and four steps. Six and eight. Now they're running across the room at you. That's how you learn to walk. You walk, you fall. You walk, you fall. But you get back up and you keep walking. That's the spiritual life. It's not the life of having it all together spiritually in my faith at the beginning. It is learning to grow in Christ. That's progressive sanctification. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said something that I thought was rather magnificent back in the 1960s, lecturing on the book of Ephesians. He said, your spiritual life should be lived out in such a way that you would actually say, look at me. Look what I'm doing. I'm being generous. I've never been generous before in my life. Look at me. I'm not cussing. I've cussed all my life. We should be astounded by ourselves. You know what that is? That is Christ being formed in you. And that occurs over time. And why did I want to talk about the subject of progressive sanctification at this point in the narrative? Because I believe people are way too critical of David trying to determine what his motives are. His motives. I, I read a book by John Wareham when I first went to work outside of seminary. And in this book, he said, the biggest mistake someone makes in starting their own company as an entrepreneur is try to make a profit. He said, that's a disaster. What you want to do with all your heart, mind, and soul is try to survive. That's what David is doing. And his deception here, you'll notice that the Scriptures assign no motive. Now, l later, David is going to say, he's going to put the blame of himself on the priests of Nob being slain. And you know what? That's for David to do. That's not for me to assign to David. It's one thing for David to say that about himself. It's quite another for me to interpret his motive. So he comes to Nob. There's the tabernacle where the priests are. To do what? What does he say? What does the narrative say? You have food? You happen to have a weapon around here? Something I can use? Look back on those words of agony. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. What have I done? What is my sin? Let me ask you. Have you lived such a sheltered life that David coming to Nob in such a humiliated state doesn't resonate with you? You had a successful family tree. You had an educational trust prepared for you. Your parents made sure that you joined the right clubs, attended the right parties, met the right friends. You got the best of educations. And dad and mom were there guiding you all along. 
You were the prince or princess of the family. And that's called being born on third thinking you hit a triple. And if that's your background, if that's your providence, then I say to you, good, wonderful, good for you. That was exactly the providence of Moses. And we've all benefited because of his splendid upbringing and education. It's benefited us all. But for some of us, that wasn't the case. God, as it were, took us from the sheep pens and we grew up under the stars and we fought the lions and the bears. I have a 40-year-old man attends my Friday morning Bible study. He is a spectacular man. And he told me, he said, I cannot tell you how many hours I sit in a Plymouth wagon at a motel, Motel 6, Holiday Inn, and mom say to me, I'm locking the doors. I'll be back in an hour and a half. It took me three or four years to figure out what was going on. Father had abandoned the family she took up to prostitution. And is a great man today. You see, some of us came from the sheep pens. And in the blink of an eye, this young man, his whole world has turned upside down. And so whatever you think of his motive, met Nob, huh, I think he gives Ahimelech the absolute truth. He is on the king's business, and the king's business was to kill him. Let me close by telling you that I actually sat down and talked to our great professor, Dr. Bruce Walkey, about this period of time in David's life. Uh, being at Nob, uh, going to Achish of the Philistines. Tell me what's going on there, I asked him. And he smiled and he said, God is shepherding. Now, I should have followed up with 20 more questions, but I just let that one soak in. So, okay, what does shepherding mean? Well, in my little mind, shepherding means, here it is, 2 Samuel 7. That's why I wanted you specifically to know that text. It's the Davidic covenant delivered to David by Nathan the prophet. And specifically leading up to those promises, Nathan provides there an introduction. Here it is, 2 Samuel 7, 5. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Then he speaks to him regarding David's desire to build the temple. That's verses 6 and 7. Now, look at verse 8. He comes back to, to the subject, not of the temple, but of David himself. Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. El Shaddai. That's important. El Shaddai. Genesis 17.1. Abraham is 99 years old, and God appears to him, El Shaddai, and says, walk before me and be blameless. Why did he wait till he was 99? Because now, Abram is impotent, and he cannot have a son. He cannot have an heir. And so what does God do as El Shaddai? He says, your name will no longer be Abram. Abundant Father, your name will be Abraham, father of a multitude. He doubles down on his promise. 
What is El Shaddai? El Shaddai is the power of a sovereign God in the midst of your total weakness. Now, look what he's saying. 2 Samuel 7. The Davidic kingship. Look what he says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. Look at those words. I took you. That's King James, New American Standard, to be a ruler. There is the plan and there is the purpose. If that is true of David, that is true of you, and that is true of me. God has brought us into fellowship with one another for a specific purpose. And that purpose is to bring Him glory. But notice verse 9. Verse 9 is the payoff. Here's where you pull the lever and all the cash comes out of the machine. He said, I was with you wherever you went. Ah! 1 Samuel 21, 1-9. through David at Nob. He says, El Shaddai was with you. You powerful, David? You got the title. How much power you got? Well, you don't even have any food. Well, you don't even have a weapon. You think you're a king? Who's following you? Where's your army? El Shaddai was with him. And you know what? That's all he needed. The federal government's after him. No place to go. No place to hide. But God Almighty is powerful in his life. If that's true of David, that's true of you. We will go through the dark providences, the unexpected providences. And we'll conquer and we'll achieve because God Almighty, known now to us in a more fuller sense, Jesus Christ is with us and commands us to walk on the water. Come out to me. That's your God. And that's who's working in your life every day single day. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this, Your Word this morning. Lord, we're weak. We have nothing. We have nothing to bring. We have nothing to offer. You are the all-powerful One. And You're growing us up. We're not what we should be, but we're growing. And we're listening to Your Word. And You're carrying us. And we're going to make it. Because You're a great God. And You're all-powerful in the midst of our weakness. In Jesus' name, Amen.